Jeff. Welcome on into another episode of the Try Hard Academy podcast, where it's always better to get good rather than get wrecked. And in this episode, we'll be looking at a commander who made his debut in Shadows over Innistrad. Uh, Most definitely. Located high in the highlands of Nathalia, this particular legend has since roughly May of 2016 has made its impact and presence well all over known in the CDH game space. This particular legend has gone so far as to win a couple online CDH tournaments. And as of recent, this commander is still placing top 16 or better and has been consistently putting in work to dredge up the past. You can imagine how much salt has been induced by this guy. This time around... We're talking about the Gitrog monster. Let's take a dive in the frog pond and see how it works, why it works, and what can you do as a normal citizen to defend yourself from the frog. All hail the Hypnotoad. The Hypnotoad. All glory to the Hypnotoad. So, before we go any further in this whole archetype and diving deep in the frog pond let's first understand who's our amphibious overlord of this project first off the relevant text on this guy he's a five drop six six with death touch at the beginning of your upkeep sacrifice to get rock monster unless you sacrifice a land you may play additional land on each of your turns and but most important but not least whenever one or more lands cards are put in your graveyard from anywhere draw a card Yeah, the most important thing about this creature isn't necessarily the first, second, or even the third lines of text. Rather, it's that last line of rules text that pushes this guy way over the top, which effectively states that you are required to draw a card whenever one or more land cards are put into your graveyard from anywhere. We can use this fact not only to our advantage, but to the detriment of our opponents, by being able to win not only on the cleanup step of our turn, but also on other people's turns, courtesy of Emergent Zone from War of the Spark, which lets you cast spells at flash speed at the cost of sacrificing a land. Drawback? Yeah, what drawback? Yeah, no. How actually does this deck actually win here? So the primary focus of this deck revolves around Dakmore Salvage. This is a dredge combo deck that could eventually, and deterministically, loop through its deck in such that you will eventually end up with most of the cards in your deck in hand as well as an infinite amount of mana. Using Dakmore Salvage, the frog on board, and either a discard outlet or the cleanup step, the deck will dredge its library into the graveyard. This would allow it to create draw triggers on the stack while doing so. For short, some of us here at the Academy call it the Hyper Dredge Loop. Now, after reshuffling the graveyard back into your deck via a Major Eldrazi Titan or Gaia's Blessing, you'll end up resolving draw triggers and end up putting most of your deck into hand. Now, this assumes, of course, that everything goes according to plan and your opponents don't or can't interact with you. In the process, you'll come across Lotus Petal, which will allow you to generate infinite mana by looping it over and over. But how exactly do we loop Lotus Petal over and over again, you ask? For that answer, we're going to have to fly out to Kazi Land and send you a postcard from there. But before we do that, let's look first at how this deck wins. How does this deck actually win here? So after initiating the Hyper Dredge loop and generating infinite mana, we can kill the table in any number of ways. But here are just a few of them that we can use. Number one. Any instant speed spell in black that can drain life from our opponents will win you the game. In specific, MD Charm, Misery Charm, or Gats Verdict are your most effective way of doing so. This is also the most direct way to walk off with the win. Number two, we can also use Praetor's Grasp to start exiling our opponent's libraries face down as for specific uses. We definitely will talk about those shortly. Now that we've examined briefly how this archetype usually wins, let's fly on out to Kaziland and figure out just exactly how we can do what we do. Just like Graceland is the mecca for Elvis fans, so is Kaziland for Froggers. But for us, 
Kaziland isn't an actual place. It's more like a state of mind. In actual practical terms, within the game of Commander, we will be dredging our deck until we hit a Kaziland state. A state of the deck where the only cards that are left in your deck will be Kazalek, Butcher of Truth, and a land of your choice, which will oftentimes be Emergent Zone if you run it. Kaziland is important to Froggers because once we hit this deck state, we will have a 100% success draw trigger and reshuffle rate every time we pitch and dredge Dakmore Salvage. This is where our third arbitrary card comes in. Once you're able to create three draw triggers on the stack via the Kaziland state, courtesy of the Hyper Dredge loop, you can then cast at instant speed any third card that you want to loop over and over again. If you've ever wondered why Emergent Zone is a good magic card, this exact scenario is one of those few reasons why Emergent Zone is exactly that damn good. And it's especially good in this deck. Do you need mana? Lotus Petal says hi. Need to kill a table? Say no more. Ebony Charm gets the job done and then some. And that's not all that this deck can do. This world is now literally your oyster at this point. Literally. Need proof? The next part of this discussion is dedicated explicitly to using Praetor's Grasp. So, now let's actually talk about this Praetor Grasp. Mm -hmm. Because this card and the deck like this, well, the card in general has an enormous amount of utility. Sure. In the various different decks that run it. In fact, and this deck is no particularly different. In fact, this deck, it's a sudden amazing end. Mm -hmm. There's only one problem, though. You must have a PhD in magic just to understand the advanced, complex rule requirements, just to understand how to play with this thing. And the master of the grass over here, our buddy Jeff, also the deck's also the deck's builder and owner for this one, also has a fair understanding of how to use it. So, sex offender jokes aside, because I'm not grasping anybody in public appropriately or inappropriately like that. Uh, if you ever wanted to be absurdly funny with Praetor's Grasp, that card will be happy to let you indulge in your dark side by letting you steal your opponent's win cons and using them against them courtesy of all that mana you just generated off of Lotus Petal. But let's be fair for a minute. Stealing an opponent's Laboratory Maniac or Jace Wielder of Mysteries and decking yourself, that's easy to do. That's child's play. Anybody can do that. If you're like any one of us, though, here at the Academy, you have a nasty sense of humor. In fact, uh, one of my people uh, under me who is learning this deck archetype, including myself, have done this to a couple different people. Uh, we'll walk it through it. Uh, first, what we did was we used Cabal Therapy over and or over again to force our opponents to dump their hands of all non-land cards. Next, we used Assassin's Trophy or something similar to destroy all non-land permanents that our opponents controlled. Our opponents can have mana as long as they don't have meaningful cards in hand. After that, what we did was we exiled each opponent's individual graveyard with Ebony Charm. Then, using a combination of Rift Sweeper and Culling the Weak, we reshuffled all Exile cards owned by opponents back into their libraries. Then finally, for the Coup de Gras, we used Praetor's Grasp to steal every non-land card out of their deck and leave them only with lands. This effectively gives you access to their entire deck, minus their commanders, and forces them to draw nothing but lands for the rest of the game. So, obviously, we could be more elaborate than this if you really want to, but yeah. at this point, though, it's like using a bazooka to kill a housefly. It does feel like that. You're not wrong. In fact, it kind of feels like you're going into overkill. Yeah, like when those you... moments when you're playing the game and you know you could do everything mm -hmm. and the sun never created, but yeah, you know why? <laughs> yeah, it's like using somebody as your personal piece of toilet paper. <laughs> Although it's great for making... making uh, Already terrible players already feeling the showing them the good old what's up. Yeah, I'm not necessarily a big fan of like making people salty, but when people start acting rude and obnoxious, that this is where the the idiot side of me comes out, and I start going full idiot gear on them. 
But with that said, though, let's actually talk about the game plan. In fact, and more particularly, the starting seven. You're right. I mean, everything that we've set up to this point means nothing if we don't have a solid game plan going in. So let's get to the starting seven. So Get Rock Dredge, by its nature, is a fast combo deck that fevers, that favors, not fevers, speed and resiliency above all else. However, this deck is unique in that it has the ability to adapt and switch its game plan into a mid-range archetype just by the sheer virtue of its draw engines and recursion engines. This deck does have a weakness, however, and that weakness is generally found in its lack of on-stack interaction. And what that means to you as the average player is that it's important to pick your battles uh, where appropriate because you don't get that many silver bullets to deal with things, whether on the field or on the stack or otherwise. As to your starting hand, a hand about two to three lands, two to three pieces of ramp, and one to two card advantage sources, and one to two tutors, and or combo cards, would be an ideal starter in, all, in any blind matchup. This kind of setup has the potential to not only establish a strong board presence in the early game, but it can also help you to see and or gain access to the cards in your deck, barring any on-stack interaction. Now, speaking of interaction, this is where your draw engines can come in handy, uh, especially for this deck, and that's because Gitrog is our primary source of card advantage. But if we're being completely reasonable, we can't reasonably expect to have Frog just sit out there and accrue value. For that reason, the deck also runs Necropotence and Sylvan Library as secondary draw engines. Additionally, the deck can also use uh, Life from the Loam, as well as any cycling land, as a potential draw engine as well. To bring it back a full circle, there are also types of hands we should be on the lookout for during our opening sevens. Number one, a hard ramp hand. A hand that can cast Get Rog by turn two or three will often be good enough hand as Froggy can help you push forward. However though, this is a predicted on the fact that you have additional lands to follow up after casting your general. If you don't have the extra lands in hand to spare, consider shifting this kind of hand back. Yeah, the last thing you want to do is have to sack Fro uh, Froggo because you don't have the lands to keep sacking. Let's move on to number two, the ramp and contingency plan. Hands that can cast our general by turn four or five but that have the ability to keep going if our general gets countered or removed immediately, are also potentially serviceable hands. You'll find that having this kind of hand is very useful in control matchups, and control heavy matchups especially, such as ones where blue decks are most definitely prevalent. Uh, 4C Rashmi comes to mind, for example. Urza Scepter Control, for example, as well. The litany goes on. Yeah, to fairy chain veil stacks. It goes on and on. At these kinds of tables, you can reasonably expect that your general is going to be a prime target for removal in these situations. So having a backup plan or two in case that happens will help you keep camouflaged. Murphy's Law is a friggin' monster. <laughs> Murphy's Law is also awesome. Yeah, it is. So, number three, draw engines. Mm -hmm. If your opener has some sort of draw value in it, such as Sylvan Lightery and or Necropotence, chances are such you're probably going to make this kind of hand work for you. Assuming you have the mana to make this kind of hand work, having life from the loan and a cycling land in hand will also help you get there. A bit, quite a bit slower, other than the other two cards just mentioned. This kind of hand generally works best with stacks environments, and the reason why that's the case because the deck runs over 20 sources of mana acceleration between its mana rocks, mana dorks, and its instant speed rituals. In fact, you will reasonably expect to see at least one source of acceleration in your starting seven and oftentimes two to three sources of mana acceleration by turn three and four, which means to you as a frog pilot, at, since this deck is pretty well saturated with the mana acceleration, that means you'll probably eventually get frog online even through disruption. Well, hold on though. There's a word of caution I should make mention though regarding Necropotence specifically. Aside from that obvious state that you need to be cautious about what you discard, if a stack deck drops Pithing Needle on the field or some sort of Pithing ne Needle effect on the field and names your Necropotence, that can effectively shut you out of the game until you remove it. So be careful which kind of a stacks environment you walk into because that could effectively really neuter you. Yep. Let's move on. A ramp package with a tutor for Ad Nauseam or Ad Nauseam in hand. An early Ad Nauseam hand 
is pretty friggin' bonkers for any black variant deck. And this deck is definitely no exception. If you can hold up an end step ad nauseum and actually cast it at the end of turn two or even turn three, chances are you're probably in the driver's seat already. But be careful about these kinds of hands as they are also those types of all-in hands that we kind of sometimes talk about. <laughs> yeah, if you ever, if you remember me talking about ad nauseum fishbowl, I mean, this is kind of one of those hands what we're talking about. And a hand like this can leave you open to a blowout from a stray force of will or even a pack negation if somebody has the five mana to support it. Or for that matter, really any sort of free cheap counterspell. Uh, now, it doesn't hurt to have Veil of Summer or Autumn's Veil in hand in order to ensure that you can resolve it. But remember to also budget your life total appropriately, as there is a Kozilek in your deck. And taking 10 life from a Kozilek is like getting kicked in the nuts. Come on, now, don't you love it when you do it all right and it no. just gets ruined right on you? Just no. <laughs> Whatever you just said, no. After all, we actually had some games in the past, and one of, and one of the counter spells I used to destroy one of... Destroy his ad nauseum deck, hard countered one day, but it uses simply a dispel. Yeah, I remember that. That was you playing your Jora deck just as a goof around situation. You caught me off guard with that. Yeah, and you did not <laughs> did not end well for you. No, it did not. But, but to be fair, I mean that was also what a turn two ad nauseum that I flopped. Yep. This kind of hand though is generally better suited for fast combo and storm table, table per permit order per mini. As you'll probably end up being in a position where you will have the race. To the finish line. Yeah, and in circumstances like that, you know, when you're talking about having an Adnos Fishbowl uh, deck at the uh, table or some other Adnos Storm variant deck, like Jaleva Storm, for example, Jaleva Slim as they call it nowadays, uh, you will be able to, more often than not, with some exceptions, be able to outrace them if you have this kind of hand. But this is kind of... Uh, a catch is catch can hand, and you're pretty much like going all in at this point. Yeah, no, this this hand can end you in the game. So with that all being said, let's go into the mid game and late game, which is really where Frago has a tendency to shine, even though it can get there quickly. In the mid game and late game, assuming Frago is on the field, we have the ability to accrue card advantage by the nature of our land sacrifice, whether it be by fetch lands. Lands that require their sacrifice as a part of the cost, or even lands that can destroy other lands such as Strip Mine and Wasteland. I personally prefer these two types of cards because it leaves them down lands. Now, if all else fails and we can't get Frog online, we still have some options. Using Praetor's Grasp, we can steal a win con or a free counterspell from an opposing player and use it to protect ourselves from uh, other interaction on the turn that we go off. Alternatively, we can also use uh, Ramanath Excavator as a budget crucible of worlds along with a strip mine or a wasteland which will severely hinder our opponents and make their lives utterly miserable. So we've explained why this deck tech, why this deck is amazingly awesome and all the things that could happen and what we could do to our opponents. There is however one dark side with this deck. There are some pretty crippling effects against this deck. That yeah. will make our day go from, we could do whatever we want to, oh boy, here we go. Yeah, yeah, you're not wrong about mentioning <laughs> that. Uh, you know, aside from pointing out Necropotence and obviously Pithing Needle on Necropotence locking you out, you know, there obviously are additional weaknesses. Even as strong and as resilient as this deck is, it does still have some weaknesses, both in its build and its approach of dominating the game. So here are some things to keep in mind about your amphibian avatar. Number one, theft and neutralization effects. My God, I cannot tell you how bad these things are. <laughs> we need Frog to win, hands down. There's no two ways about it. What that means is a card like Gilded Drake is very bad for us. However, any Lingify effect, such as Lingify, Song of the Dryads, Imprisoned in the Moon, Darksteel Mutation, so on and so forth, they're also equally bad for us, and they must be removed before we can continue. By the way, speaking of which, as of as this current year, October 2019... Don't mention Oko. I Oko wanna... FIFA Crowns is no. legal! No. Yeah! Yeah! No. After, all, he, after all, the frog wants to be a giant elk. 
Shut up. <laughs> you know what? Your comment is a 330. <laughs> Your face looks like a 330. No. Yeah, as you mentioned, October 2019, El Throne of Eldraine got released and Oko Thief of Crowns uh, got released. For us, this Planeswalker is definitely a high alert threat for us, as it can permanently nuke your frog and turn it into a 3-3 elk with no abilities. Destroy this bastard with extreme prejudice. <laughs> do not even think twice. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. So a couple other cards that this deck is really weak against, and mm -hmm. these cards are terrible against this deck. Any type of static exile effects, such as Leyline of the Void and Rest in Peace, are a colossal problem for this deck. Yep. These cannot remain for any significant amount of time as we are a graveyard dredge deck. And since, they're, since they interact with our graveyard and sends it all the way to the dark end of the world, mm -hmm. we cannot interact with them. Until we get rid of them, we cannot go off. And until then, we're sitting around looking like a giant dumb frog. Yeah, you're not wrong. And, you know, here's a funny thing also. You know how uh, Frogo talks about uh, whenever one or more lands goes to your graveyard from anywhere? So, Leyline of the Void and Rest in Peace are replacement effects, which means even though we still have to sacrifice lands, we never get any card draw value off of it. <laughs> That's bad for us, needless to say. So, yeah, those cards cannot stick around for any sort of length of time whatsoever. We cannot combo through any of those types of effects. Moving on, though. Rule of Law effects, surprisingly, are actually pretty good against us as well. So, this is a fast combo deck, as we mentioned earlier, that needs to be able to cast multiple spells in the same turn in order to combo off officially in order to kill the table. What this means is cards like Rule of Law, Arcane Laboratory, Idol on of Rhetoric, cards like this must be killed prior to comboing off, otherwise we can't do it. Speaking of another card, this card right here, we already discussed about how great the utility of this card is. Mm -hmm. And how it needs a PhD just to understand on how busted this card is in this deck. However, though, it is not that way in countering this deck. Yeah. yeah this deck gets, with a Praetor's Gas and the right choice of a card, this deck is suddenly, let's just say, sputtering to get there. Uh, that's being very polite. That's very it, nice. You remember how I was talking about taking uh, a kick in the nuts off of a Kozlek from, from an Adnos flip? Yeah. Yeah, like this is like getting kicked in the face by a donkey. Yep. By stealing the Kozlik out of this deck, you've just sealed this deck's doom. Well, yes and no. Let me touch on that. So while Praetor's Grasp is extremely good in our deck, for obvious reasons which we mentioned earlier, it's even better in an opponent's deck. Praetor's Grasp, stealing your Kozilek, can spell the end for you if you're running the traditional Gaius Blessing build, as you can then not deterministically hyper dredge loop without eventually decking yourself. In fact, the only way you can really get around that is by the usage of a combination of cards, specifically Entomb, Gaia's Blessing itself, and then Noxious Revival. And where the problem comes in is having to try to gain that extra life back off a of Noxious Revival, because you're paying two life in order to get around that issue. Yeah. Now, for circumstances like this, you may have to run what they call a Double Titan Blitz build if you expect to play in metas where Praetor's Grasp is common. For this style of build, uh, we would prefer to instead refer you to Forgotten Kane's Double Titan Blitz build, which we'll also be including as a part of our references section, both in the written article and on the video itself on YouTube. But basically, this type of deck, uh, in some cases, foregoes Ad Nauseam and instead goes with a Twin Titan build instead, along with Tainted Pact, mind you, <laughs> in order to get to Dak more Savage quicker. <laughs> Another... so, so, actually, I want to also touch on one more thing, especially with Praetor's Grasp, because this thing is going to kill. Praetor's Grasp, stealing your Dak more Salvage, is perhaps the most dangerous thing you could ever run into as a Frogger. If they steal your Dakmore Salvage, you cannot combo off deterministically. You're dead at that point. You're basically left to having to beat people down with Frog manually. Yeah. Another type of cards that we have to watch out for heavily here. Cursed Totem effects. Yeah. Cursed Totem, Linvala Keeper of Silence. Leaves us in a nasty position to overcome. Because most of the discard outlets, pretty much all the discard outlets, 
are all creature centric yep. and they require activated abilities. Mm -hmm. And they prevent them from comboing off and they must be removed when and where they crop up. That's right. Moving on, let's talk about targeted exile effects. So, in terms of dealing with these types of effects, there are measures you can take to protect yourself. For surgical extraction and other tar targeted exile effects uh, related to your graveyard, we can usually play around them as long as we have additional lands in hand to pitch our, to our discard outlet. The good thing here is that for every land that we have in our hand, that allows us to blank a piece of removal reactively, and that helps us by letting us take control of the stack again. Additionally, we have Autumn's Veil and Veil of Summer to help do double duty and help us get through these kinds of issues when they crop up. There is an exception to this rule, however, and that card is Extirpate. And this is where, unfortunately, things get really ugly for us. Specifically for Extirpate, Extirpate targeting our Kozilek in response to the reshuffle trigger can kill us outright in a Gaia's Blessing style of build unless we can somehow flash in Rift Sweeper after the spell has resolved. This is because of the split second keyword associated with Extirpate which says as long as the spell is on the stack, players cannot cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. What that means is that the only way to fight through an extirpate is if your discard outlet is specifically a Scourge Familiar. And that's because the activated discard ability on it is a mana abilities, and mana abilities do not use the stack. Yeah, no, it's, extirpate is a death sentence against this deck. A well-timed extra bait can be a death sentence for us. Yes. But thankfully so, we do have some countermeasures we can work with, uh, which were the measures we just recently touched on. It's not easy for them to stop us, but if they know how to proactively and reactively stop us, we're dead in the water. Yes. And with this, we have, with this deck tech, we've gone over predominantly the guy's blessing variation of Get Rock Dredge. However, though, we would like to remiss, though, if we didn't state there were, in fact, three versions of this archetype. First is the traditional guy's blessing build, which we have just covered here. However, though, it's not the only way to build frog. You're right to mention that. One of the other versions, which we uh, just mentioned, as I mentioned, was the double titan blitz variant, which uh, makes use of both Eldrazi titans and tainted pact in place of certain cards. We'll also be linking that list as appropriate, uh, since that list covers more of its style of build and how it approaches the game. However, there is a third ver version which we did not explicitly touch on, uh, and that's because it's a bit fringe. This is a Stax version of Get Rog Dredge, which uses cards like Oppression, Desolation, uh, in, and even Chains of Mephistopheles, believe it or not. <laughs> as well as Pox cards, if you'll believe that. <laughs> in order to accrue card value. Now, this archetype, this particular style of archetype, doesn't see that much play, as Gaia's Blessing style of builds and Double Titan builds are generally more favored in recent times. However, it still creeps up, you know, out of the blue once in a while. Generally not in CDH games, but some people have this, you know, wonky sense of adventure and they want to bring those out during those times. So that's when you will generally see it. Oh man, that, that's, pro that's probably an annoying archetype just to stumble into. Yeah, a Stax variant frog is like getting... <laughs> It's like getting kicked in the dick and then getting divorced at the same time. It's like, what the heck is happening here? My reality is shattering. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> yeah, it's like getting kicked in the nuts and then being divorced uh, without a prenuptial agreement. <laughs> so, with all that said, that's all the time that we have for this episode of the Dryer Academy podcast. If you like this content, feel free to like and share this video and even subscribe to this channel for future content. And as always... It's, it's always, always better, better to get good rather than get wrong. There you are. Wait, don't run away.